Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, exciting upcoming courses preview for the autumn term in 2021. Uh, my name is Gabriel Schenk, and I will be facilitating this discussion about our upcoming classes. Uh, the image you see on your screen is of my pumpkins. I took this photograph earlier today, uh, and you might be thinking they're an odd color for pumpkins. Well, they are supposed to look like that. They're blue pumpkins. They're green at the moment, but they will turn blue by Halloween and they will be delicious. Uh, these are the two pumpkins that the slugs didn't get. Um, but I thought it would be a good image to start us off with because it illustrates where we are in the year. End of summer, we're kind of holding on to summer for dear life in the UK, just desperate for every last drop of sunshine. Um, but uh, Autumn is a coming, pumpkins are a ripening, and pretty soon we'll be uh, immersed in the fall term at Signum University. So this is what this event is all about, getting people uh, onboarded, um, getting uh, aunt questions answered, uh, helping people decide what course to take if you're still on the fence, or if you just want to know a bit more about what we do at Signum University. It's great to have you join us. Two quick announcements before we get stuck in. First of all, we have an event coming up next week on Thursday. Uh, Dr. Joy Sanchez-Taylor will be talking about her new book, Diverse Futures, Science Fiction and Authors of Color uh, here at Signum University. She's visiting and she's gonna tell us all about her work um, so do join us for that. It's a free event. You go to signumuniversity.org forward slash event. You'll see the sign up for that event uh, next Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Sorry, at 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. British time. Um, but uh, check out the details on the website. Also on the website, you will see a sign up for a conference called New England Moot which is taking place in New England, which is the new version of England. Uh, very exciting for me coming from old England. Uh, can't wait to see all the new technology in the future uh, landscape of New England. Um, this is happening on September 25th. The theme this year is Second Breakfast. You can find out all about that on the website, uh, signaluniversity.org forward slash event. And you can sign up give a paper, you can register, you can register online as an online attendee, or you can register to attend in person as well. So those are the announcements. Now let's crack on with this event. Uh, we've got four really exciting courses to talk about. Uh, brand new course, Ursula K. Le Guin, World Builder, uh, lectured by Professor Chris Swank, precepted by uh, Sarah Brown and Brenton Dickinson. Chris and Sarah are on hand to answer any questions about that course and tell us a bit about it. We also have the story of the Hobbit, which is not a new course. It's, it's one of our established courses, uh, lectured by uh, Professor Corey Olson based on his research on the Hobbit. Um, and Sarah will be on hand to talk about that course as well. We also have The Life and Times of the English Epic, lectured by Professor Faith Acker. This is not quite a new course, but almost a new course. It was only offered once before, spring 2019, so it still has that new course smell. Um, yeah. And uh, Professor Acker will be on hand to you, answer questions about that course and talk about it a bit. And then we also have a really exciting uh, language course, Beowulf in Old English. Get to read the text Beowulf in Old English. It's right there on exactly what it says on the tin. And delighted to have Professor Paul Peterson here to talk about that course as well. Uh, if you're in the live audience, please do interact with us. We have the questions box. You can type out your questions. This is your opportunity to ask any questions you like. Uh, in advance of the uh, term beginning. Takako says, two cool courses to choose from. Absolutely, it's always it's always a bit of a challenge uh, choosing just one course. Um, you can do as many as you like, but um, a lot of students just choose one. 
um, but hopefully this event will help you choose. And before we get stuck into the courses, uh, I had a question come in through an email, which I thought I would share because um, I think it would help other people. Um, someone was asking about time zones and uh, wanting to get the time right for classes. So um, we are a global university, but we're based in New Hampshire. So we use Eastern time. And so when you see a time on the website or advertised anywhere, it's always Eastern time. When you sign up through GoToWebinar, you will get very helpful email reminders an hour before the event, a day before the event, and those will be adjusted to your time zone. So you can't go wrong if you follow GoToWebinar, um, but if you are following the actual, um, the actual time, then it is Eastern time. And Wade says not to be confused with Old Hampshire, absolutely, which is, of course, British summertime at the moment. Um, fantastic. Uh, let's crack on and let's talk about Ursula K. Le Guin, world builder. Uh, Professor Swank, um, tell us about this course and tell us about Ursula K. Le Guin. Ursula K. Le Guin is probably the uh, most prominent author of fantasy and science fiction from the United States in the 20th century and the, the very early 21st century. She passed away in 2018. So having her body of work completed, I don't think she's going to keep publishing after death the way Tolkien does, because that was something new every year. I think we've pretty much seen most of uh, what Ursula Le Guin has written. It seemed time to do a, a survey course of her, her major works. So we're going to be looking at um, several works in the Hainish cycle, which is her major science fiction. Um, it's not really a series in the way that um, Wheel of Time or Game of Thrones are one right after the other in time. It's different planets, different time periods, but they all take place in the same universe. So we'll call those the Hainish universe um, books. And then uh, the books of Earthsea, which is her major fantasy series. And she's very unique for having written in both uh, bestsellers and Hugo winners and uh, Locus winners and world fantasy winners in both sci-fi and fantasy. So she's a somebody that deserves all the attention we can give her. Absolutely, and actually there was a, uh, I think Dimitra Femi did a poll on Twitter saying, if you couldn't name Tolkien, who is the biggest fantasy writer there is? And Ursula Le Guin was miles ahead of everyone else. Everyone else. And she should mm -hmm. be hugely important in science fiction as well, hugely important in just any kind of literature. Um, so it's fantastic to have her in the in in the uh, Signum curriculum. Um, you mentioned the Hainish cycle. You mentioned Earthsea. Can you tell us a little bit more about the choices you made for the reading list and what students can expect? Yes, it's it's quite a a good reading list. Um, the nice thing about Le Guin is that she doesn't write six hundred page novels like George R. R. Martin. So we're not reading 12 George R. R. Martin sized novels. Her novels are more 150 to 300 pages in that in that range and mostly on the shorter side. So we'll be reading um, several of her essays, which are also rather short, some of her short stories, and three novels in the Hainish cycle, which are her best known. Um, sci-fi books, The uh, Left Hand of Darkness, The Dispossessed, and The Word for the World is Forest. And I believe those were all Hugo winners. So we're reading um, the ones that the fans voted um, in the year that they were published as the best novel of the year. So students won't be reading absolutely everything Le Guin wrote because, you know, that would take at least Too much. five courses. Yes, but, it would be like trying to read the histories of Middle Earth in one semester. So we're not going to do that. But will you? But people will be sort of coming away from the course having read kind of arguably the main stuff, or at least the you know the really big important stuff that everyone talks about. Yes. Excellent, fantastic, and science fiction and fantasy as well, which is really exciting. We are reading all of the Earthsea books because you really just can't stop at one. She 
continues to develop that world in new ways. And if you stop reading, you don't understand her whole vision. So I did kind of squeeze all of those in. Fantastic. Um, Lola asks, what elements does uh, Professor Swank see as being included in, quotation, world building? That is a wonderful question. And it's a great uh, word. It describes her because she literally created worlds. Every new Hainish book, she created a new planet and had to think of the climate and the, what the people were like, um, what the economy was like, what the language was like, what their marriage customs were like. Anything you can think of that creates a society or an environment goes into world building. So this is a catch-all term that lets us look at all of the different ways that Le Guin created um, a new planet or for Earthsea, um, a new secondary world. Everything. So world building is everything. Terrific. Um, and Sara, can you tell us a bit about your experience of Le Guin and what you're looking forward to as a preceptor? Prior to preparing for this course, my major involvement with reading Le Guin was Earthsea because fantasy is is my jam, not really science fiction. So when I heard, oh, Ursula K. Le Guin going to have a new course, I thought, great, it's going to be Earthsea, that's for sure. So that was wonderful. But I'd never read her science fiction. So thanks to Chris Swank, I've now read some of her science fiction, which is just extraordinary um, because when it comes to world building and you know there's the link to the course right there she's amazing um, the way in which she pulls you into her world and makes it feel not real but somewhere that you can actually see and feel an experience is incredible and that's something that i'd only really attributed to tolkien before because you know Anybody who's had any passing acquaintance to me knows about my desperate love for Tolkien's work. Um, but when it comes to Le Guin, I already adored her Earthsea work, but it was having that chance to immerse myself in her sci-fi. That's the new thing for me. And that is so exciting for me because it's great to see a different side of her writing um, and see the way in which, um, when we think of fantasy and sci-fi, we know the difference between them. We can see how fantasy kind of looks back um, and it involves things that look ancient. So, you know, people shoot you with bows and arrows and they hit you over the head with swords. Um, or, you know, you have my axe kind of idea. When it comes to sci-fi, we're looking forward. And so we're seeing a, a world ahead of ours almost. And so here we have Le Guin planted firmly in the middle of that. That is amazing. Um, so what I'm looking forward to actually is I want to listen to Professor Swank's lectures on the Hainish cycle because I want to learn more about those particular books. So um, that's where my node of excitement lies, if you like, with this particular course. Yeah, I mean, amazing. And we have uh, fantastic fantasy courses and fantastic science fiction courses and this is going to be a, a really amazing blend as well right um, she bridges the gap between the two and how extraordinary is that because mm -hmm. that's really unusual for any author yeah absolutely and and give something for everyone as well um so uh, uh you know uh, if you're thinking of signing up you'll find something to like in this course i'm sure um chris before we um move on i want to ask about these words in the schedule so power race culture religion feminism uh, revisions these are quite big topics so you're not just reading the book so even though that would be enough you're also thinking about some of these bigger ideas you're using Le Guin in order to think through these ideas or are you finding all of this just in Le Guin's work how how does that work well she's our guiding star so definitely she'll be the center of all those discussions take a book like uh, A Wizard of Earthsea. You can look at that from a point of view of looking at the races of Earthsea and how she depicted races, economy, her system of magic, her system of uh, language and um, naming. One of our students, uh, Maximilian Hart, just did his master's thesis 
mm-hmm. on um, just dragon speech, the old speech in, in the Wizard of Earthsea. So we, would, we only have one week on each of these books. You could do, well, in fact, Dr. Olson did about uh, six or eight weeks just on a Wizard of Earthsea. You could take each one of these works and study them ad infinitum. So um, I've just picked one idea for each week to try to focus our discussion. Uh, we'll have two lectures a week and then preceptor session for the folks taking it for MA credit or um, discussion audit. And they can decide, of course, to go off of those topics. Let's say that we're looking at um, issues of who has power in Earthsea and the preceptor session students decide that they want to talk more about race. So it's not um, locked into those topics, but those are sort of guideposts to get us started on looking at the different aspects of world building in Le Guin. Fantastic. Well, it sounds uh, so interesting, so exciting. Um, And uh, yeah, I I bet you're you're excited to get started as well. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Swank and Professor Brown for uh, answering those questions about this course. If you're in the audience and you have more questions, um, you can keep on asking them put them in the the Q&A and I'll ask them at the end. And if you're watching this on YouTube later on, uh, you can of course get in touch with any of the teachers through our website if you have a question that uh, wasn't asked during this session. And you can check out the Maximilian Maximilian Hart thesis theater on YouTube and Dr. Corey Holson's uh, FC um, talks as well if you want some free course watching to get you in the mood. Um, Excellent. Well, let's move on to the story of the Hobbit. So this is uh, Professor Brown again, um, precepting with lectures by Dr. Corey Olson. Um, Sarah, what can you tell us about this course? Um, Yeah, it's going to be a busy semester for me. (laughs) Okay, so um, The great thing about doing this is that we're actually going to take a deep dive and look at The Hobbit as literature, not just as a children's story, and it is a children's story and a very effective one, but we're looking at it as a piece of literature. Uh, And we start off by looking at the literature that came before. So in other words, the influences for The Hobbit. Um, And we'll start off by reading some really wonderful books that most of us remember from our childhood, like um, Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass and Winnie the Pooh and uh, even older ones like The Princess and the Goblin, The Marvelous Land of Snurgs. And if you haven't read any of those, that's a, a treat waiting for you. So we set the scene by looking at what comes before and then we move into The Hobbit itself and look at the way in which Tolkien draws on that older fantasy to create his own world within The Hobbit. And we have to remember just how long ago he started writing The Hobbit. Um, So we look all the way back there and we see him starting to build his world of Middle Earth. And where are all of these ideas coming from? And how can we see resonances of uh, the older fantasies within this children's story that he created before we move into, okay, well, what is going on with Middle Earth? How does this actually come to be? Where does this evolve from? Um, and so we look at uh, like things like the 1930 Quenta Silmarillion. So we look at old um, early writings where he starts to create this idea of what Middle Earth actually is. Um, We look at uh, bits and pieces from the shaping of Middle Earth. So some of like the history of Middle Earth series that was mentioned just a a few minutes ago. And then having kind of put all of that into context, we use um, John Ratliff's book, um, which is the history of The Hobbit, uh, and look at the the annotations that are made there by uh, Doug Anderson as well on um, what is going on with the way in which The Hobbit is put together as a story? Uh, And we take it in various phases. So um, we look at, we start off with, for example, 
in a hole in the ground and then we move on to bag end to Bayonne and then Mirkwood to the lake and so on and so on and so on. So we take it in different phases. Um, and it's not just about reading the story because we can all do that, but it's about looking at each section and all of the themes that are coming out of it and the way in which the world is being constructed and looking at Tolkien's craft. And that's a really great thing to do with The Hobbit because often it's dismissed as it's a children's story. And then we look at the Lord of the Rings or the Silmarillion as being, I don't know, real fiction. I don't know. But looking at The Hobbit in this way, we can really start to see Tolkien's craft beginning to come to life. And I find that very exciting and very interesting. And yeah, Tolkien, what can I say? <laughs> well, it sounds fantastic and uh, dispels any, any ideas, if there were any uh, among the audience, that this is like the light course or the kind of, you know, you only oh, read yeah. one book and it's just a children's book. No, no, you read lots of stuff, you do all the context. Um, it's it's uh, it sounds like a really fascinating deep dive, and The Hobbit is one of those texts that sort of surprises you. I reread it last year, and mm -hmm. there's a whole bit in it about how goblins invented the machines that later on would be used in the World War, and it's just like I, I was like I don't remember this being in there. And it's really interesting, and I could just sort of write a whole paper just on that paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, and it went over my head as a child. And there's actually so much in there, uh, even without thinking about all the context that you do. So um, I don't know, do you, do you keep on finding new things in it as you read it? That's the beauty of Tolkien, right? Yeah. That's why I, I am so stupidly enthusiastic about Tolkien, ridiculously, idiotically enthusiastic about Tolkien, um, to the point where people actually have to ask me to quietly go away or just you know sit down and shut up because there's always a, no, no i know Captain <laughs> win. um because there's always something new about it i mean at my exalted age i have now read all of these works so many times and yet i keep reading them because there's always something new and the beauty of the hobbit is that yes, you can read it as a children's story. Of course you can read it as a children's story, but it doesn't have to end there. Um, it's a bit Shrek-like in that it's an onion, in that there are so many lo lovely layers to peel back and see, oh, there's all these things here and not every layer is gonna make you cry. Maybe one or two mm -hmm. of them will, but some of them will make you laugh. But there's all sorts of things in there for you to pick apart and see what's really going on under the surface because if this was just a simple children's story why would we still be talking about it so many years after it was published answer because there's a lot embedded in there that is still so relevant today um and you can I think you can talk about it for hours simply because you can pick out, like you were just saying, there's a paragraph there that you hadn't remembered. And you can look at that and pick that apart and talk about that just on its own. Yeah. OK, I'll, yeah. I'll stop now because I really <laughs> could take up the whole of this time. But what's not to love? And then, of course, so many people have done things with The Hobbit, which is why we move on to looking at um, yeah. all these um films that have been made, including, of course, the Jackson films. And, and we look at those and, and we examine the good things and the bad things about those. And um, we talk about why people who have adapted The Hobbit have done so in the ways that they have. So there's, there's yeah, there's loads I, to talk about. Yeah, I have to say, um, I, re I actually read The Hobbit as an adult and I thought, I all my life, I thought I'd read The Hobbit because I grew up with the audio dramatization done by the BBC, which is a wonderful dramatization, mm. I think. Um, it, it's not related to the, the one they did of Lord of the Rings with Ian Helm as Frodo, which is also amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, for me, those are kind of like canon in a weird way. Sort of, it's all kind of merged together in my head. And I, I, I was shocked when I realized I hadn't actually read The Hobbit, I just thought I had. Mm. Um, so, but you also do, as you mentioned, Jackson, how how does that work? Because am I right in thinking that the lectures were originally recorded before Jackson? Did mm -hmm. Dr. Olson come back and update the course or, or is that done through the preceptor sessions? 
that's going to be done through the preceptor sessions um which is great i mean that's one of the wonderful things about even though this is a flex course because the preceptor is very much live i will certainly attempt to be as alive as possible in each session um you get to talk about the modern stuff that is right up to date so even though these lectures by dr olson were recorded a couple of years ago well a few years ago now everything we're going to do in the class will actually view the hobbit from a 2021 position and so we can actually see it from lots of different optics and that i think is really exciting because there's always as i said something new um, and i think it is important to look at the jackson adaptations um, and understand the choices that were being made mm -hmm. and why those choices were made um, because I think actually what's interesting about them is not just, you know, you want to watch the film, do you enjoy the film or don't you want enjoy the film? But what is left out? Why? What's been added in? Why? What is it about a cinematic audience of 2021 that might demand that this is in there that wasn't in the text or that this is left out? So there's, you know, there's a conversation to be had about it. Fantastic. Well, I sign me up. Um... <laughs> One practical point to mention, I know we were talking about this a, a few weeks ago, uh, looking at the reading list, the John Rateliff book, um, I think is only available on Kindle in the United States. Mm. Uh, I know there was some, there was some, I, something about that. And I think uh, it's, people want to get the one volume edition of that rather than the two volume edition, because the one volume is updated. If you're in the UK, you can buy the one volume edition. I've got it on my bookshelf. Uh, and it's a it's a hefty bugger, um, and but it's quite nice to have in uh, the print version. But actually, the the ebook version must be even better because then you can do a search and find mm -hmm. the bit you're wanting to look up. So mm -hmm. presumably, Sarah, it's okay for people to use the ebook editions. You're not gonna whichever works. It it matters not um because you know we have ways of helping people to cite from an ebook version if they're not sure how to do that 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 can be explained in class um yes. but what's more important is they actually have access to it and however that is it, it doesn't matter to me at all great thank you for clarifying that and anthony writes in to say i was able to order one from amazon and it was around 50 dollars us us dollars after shipping so that's a pretty good price actually uh, yeah, so that right. option is available if you want to have the, the the thing in your hands that you can also use to, you know, whack someone over the head with or use to <laughs> prop open the door, whatever Not it is. Not that we would advocate that level of violence at all, thank you. Only only for goblins and trolls uh, in oh, yeah, the dire right. circumstances in the minds of Moria. Um, but uh, yeah, um, good to know that it is possible to get that and very easy to get as an ebook as well. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Brown, for all that information uh, and your enthusiasm. I'm also, well, I'm I'm now wanting to do two courses. I'm sure I'm going to be about to want to do a third course and a fourth course as we move on with this event, because let's now talk about the life and times of the English epic uh, lectured by Professor Faith Acker. Uh, Faith, uh, what can you tell us about this course? Well, um, I think probably the most important thing is to acknowledge that there is a bit of a hefty reading load in this course, uh, but I think it's a really fun reading load. Um, this course, The Life and Times of the English Epic, is divided into three sections. And the heart of the course, that middle section, is really mostly John Milton's Paradise Lost, with a few other contemporaneous English epics circling around. There's a little bit of Fairy Queen. We don't read all the Fairy Queen, um, even all the bits that were written, because that would be its own course as well. Um, and then the first third is really building you up to Milton. What is Milton drawing on as the great classical epics when he's trying to write the great English epic? And so we spend some time with the early English, the first English translations of texts like the Aeneid, um, a early version of Lamort Arthur, 
Uh, actually, not the earliest translation of the Inferno, but one of my favorite versions because it's a, a dual language. So you can look over and see some of the Italian on the left. And then we look at how Milton and some of his contemporaries in the late Renaissance and the Restoration periods have developed the English epic out of both these classical traditions, these French traditions, the Italian traditions, and then added in the Christian tradition as sort of the, the ultimate Christian, with the, the Christ being the ultimate um, sort of hero of the epic. And then after Milton, we go a little bit nuts and we look at just a bunch of different ways in which the epic has been interpreted by English and actually one Irish. We've got um, Lewis is in there as I think Professor Schrank, mm -hmm. you reminded yep. me a couple of years ago, he's not properly English, <laughs> uh, so I can't insult not him a, like not that. Not at all English, really. <laughs> no, he's not English at all. Um, yeah. But he is he he got snuck in there because Perilandra is such a wonderful adaptation of the epic that is read often in England today. So a bit of a fudge there. Um, also, heroes like James Bond, very Br British. Uh, Jude the Obscure is not really a traditional epic. And so we look at some ways in which the epic has been mutated a little bit and transformed and where you ways to find epic elements in texts that we wouldn't normally read as epics. And then at the very end, I think we end with um, Hot Fuzz, yes. which is just a really weird and fun film that is actually coming back and looking at it through an epic lens made me really enjoy the film a lot more than I did the first times through it. Um, and there is a bonus because Professor Shank actually contributed a lecture to this course two years ago. Um, so you get to enjoy uh, his wisdom and insights as well. And Professor Serena Higgins, who isn't here tonight, but she's got one, a really great one on the ways that the Inklings interpreted epics. So I, yeah. I feel like it's packed full of a lot of fun, exciting things. It really is. Um, I really enjoyed contributing my one lecture and in order to prepare to give my lecture, I, I thought I'd do due diligence and just, you know, watch one of the uh, previous lectures. I ended up watching about five or six of them. I would have watched the whole lot if I if I uh, had time, but I had to start working on my lecture. But it was such an engaging course. Um, I love the way you, so <laughs> you've got this word epic in there. And epic is one of those big, slippery, you know, epic words um, mean different things to different people. It's a genre, it's a form, it's a tradition. You have this fantastic uh, um, definition of epic that you you use throughout the course. And it's almost like a biography of that term as you follow through uh, time. Um, and then, yeah, just so much fun doing uh, Virgil and James Bond and Hot Fuzz and C.S. Lewis and Philip Pullman all in the same course and it all working. Um, so I yeah I really enjoyed my little bit of it. I sing at the end of my lecture. I don't know if that's um, something to put you off or something to bring you in, but it, uh, it puts you off. It's only for five minutes. You can skip that bit. Uh, and all the other lectures are done by Faith Acker or Serena Higgins uh, does a one as well. Um, I, I would say that the singing is not to be missed, and if you're torn <laughs> between this and one of the other courses, that should be the thing that tips you over. <laughs> um, and uh, and Hot Fuzz, uh, my sister just booked us a hotel room in Wells uh, just today. We're visiting Cornwall on holiday, and Wells is where they filmed Hot Fuzz. So I'm slightly worried that I'm going to get involved in a shootout or go on an epic quest. <laughs> but, um, We'll see how we do. Um, we've got a fantastic question from Joe, directed to Dr. Acker. He says, uh, I am a new Signum student. If you could give one piece of advice to someone who is taking your course as their first course at Signum, what would it be? I don't know that this is specific to my course. But I think that my advice to somebody who's a new student at Signum, and this is certainly relevant to my course, is to throw yourself into the community that we have here. 
as wholeheartedly as possible. So a big difference for me between the Signum classes and the master's programs that I've been through in my own life is that we have this wonderful, robust community. You'll get an hour of live discussion every week, but you also have discussion boards and you can foster friendships with other colleagues, other, other scholars. So use those as a way to make connections. If you think something is funny in the text, don't be afraid just to post a discussion board like, I thought this was funny. The discussion board doesn't have to be you sounding smart. It can be you asking a question that puzzled you. It can be you pointing out a joke that you thought was amazing in the text. It can be a quotation that you just want to say, I really loved this quotation in the text. Did anybody else have something that jumped out at them? So my advice would be, don't be afraid to dive into that community and to initiate some of those discussions, because I think the heart of a lot of courses for me is how the students interact with one another. And your time together in person is a little bit limited, but the time that you can spend talking about the text in other ways, or even if there's something that you find fascinating that I don't talk about in the lecture, put a comment about that in the discussion board. And I'll usually hold back the first few days because I don't want to motivate that discussion. I want to make sure you all are able to talk to each other as students, but I'll certainly be watching those. I'll often refer to the discussion boards in my preceptor sessions. Uh, and also, don't be afraid to email your professors, uh, me or Professor Brown or Professor Swank, or I'm sure Professor Peterson as well. Um, you know, connect with us if you've got questions or you've got concerns. Uh, make make use of the community that you have would be my top recommendation for my course, but I think also for the other ones too. Yeah, I think that's fantastic um, advice. And Takako adds, um, it is intimidating when you are new and it is now for recurring students too. So do ask for help. Um, and Takako admits um, the reading load scares me every time. Um, so if you're if you're starting off and you're a new student, this is your first course, and you're looking at that reading lesson, and you're thinking, what have I got myself in for? <laughs> Don't worry, that's everyone feels like that. It will it will go okay. Um, and reach out for help if you need it. And remember, you're all in the same boat. Um, you know, we're not pretending these courses are easy or light. They are fun. They're engaging. Um, but they're literary master's courses, so we do expect you to do a lot of reading and thinking and discussing. And I think it does get easier after the first few weeks if you are starting out new, or even if you're not starting out new. Um, get through those first few weeks, reach out to each other, talk to your professor, and you will um, you will not only get through it, but you will flourish and you will enjoy it. Uh, I'm sure. So fantastic advice from from uh, Professor Acker as, uh, and Takako, thank you, uh, Takako-san. Uh, anything to add from, from anyone else? Because that's a really good question. Um, any advice for your courses for first-time students? We've covered everything. Or well, anything to add, Sarah? That, yeah. yeah, I just I think I would say that there's no such thing as a dumb question. Mm -hmm. um, so don't sit there in class thinking, oh, I'm not sure if I should ask this. Yes, ask this. Um, whatever you want to ask, ask this. There's, there is no such thing as a silly question, just a question that needs an answer. Um, so don't be afraid to speak up. But if you don't feel comfortable speaking out in class, start off by putting it in the chat box and we'll mm -hmm. start there. So, you know, dip your toe in. Um, but you'll find that everybody in class and even your very stern looking professors that are sitting here are actually incredibly welcoming um, and would want you to participate as much as possible. So just don't be afraid to do that um, and, and go ahead and say what you want to say, ask what you want to ask, um, because we would like that, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Chris, did you want to add something as well? I, I just wanted to reiterate that it's true. After the first couple of weeks, it gets easier. And this is why. If you're new here, maybe you've come to this through the Professor Olson's Miss Guard Academy 
where he takes one book and looks at it for, you know, 52 weeks or something. And so he's looking at every minute little piece of that book. And we just don't have time to do that in the 12 week classes where you're reading several books. So you've got this book and you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be paying attention to. I don't know what I'm supposed to be reading. And so after the first few lectures and preceptor sessions, you'll get the groove of what is important in that particular class and you'll start reading for that thing and it'll get easier as it goes along. Mm -hmm. So uh, honestly, um, I've been through these classes as a student and that's how it worked for me. It's, uh, and I'm still alive. <laughs> and Eric uh, says, as a veteran at Signum, I totally agree that participation and interaction are a key part of the course. Um, so fantastic to have your uh, reiteration of that as well. Thank you, Eric. Um, let's move on to Beowulf in Old English and Professor Paul Peterson is on hand to talk about this. I believe um, Nelson Goering is also uh, the teacher for this course, is that correct, Paul? Yeah, yeah. we have three, three preceptors in total this time, which is great. Um, so Nelson Goering and also um, Larry Swain. So oh, we're going to have a, a three three different preceptors. We all have training in Old English and all of that. Um, so we're really excited to run this again. It is a continuation course from our Introduction to Old English. Um, once upon a time was called Introduction to Anglo-Saxon, which is a fine name for the people, but not the language. So it's now called um, Introduction to Old English. So this is our second semester advanced uh, language seminar, which means no lectures. Um, but what it does in uh, to replace the lectures is we have a lot more translation. So this is a course that is really about language specifically. Um, that is a, the focus. But we do explore all of the scholarly avenues. Um, this is, of course, a, a great work of old English literature. Um, it is, you know, sometimes thought of as one of the first great works of English literature. I don't know if it really even belongs to um, our culture or, or I mean, it really kind of falls between worlds. Um, it goes back in time to ancient Scandinavia. Um, the tale does not take place at all in England, um, which is, I think, a curious fact about, about the poem. So um, it's about 3,100 something lines. That's a lot of text uh, in Germanic alliterative verse or uh, specifically an old English variant of that. Um, we don't know the date of this poem, um, but we do know the, roughly the date of the manuscript. There's only a single surviving manuscript, badly damaged, charred around the edges. We have a lot of text that has been lost uh, through time. Um, so we will look at the, the entirety of the poem, you know, slogging through it um, week by week. So I, I think the math on it would be it's about 265 lines per week on average. Um, so this course meets for two 90-minute meetings per week. Um, that's sort of to supplement the fact that we don't have lectures, so there's an extra half hour tagged on. Our regular language classes are two hours, um, so this will be a total of three per week. And yeah, it's a lot of translation, and we do include um, some of the kind of essential scholarly background for, for the text. Um, and you'll notice I refer to it as a text. That's a philologist way of, of talking about something and um, not a book or um, a tale or a story. We call it the text because that's what's in the manuscript. Um, so we only have this, this single uh, example of a text that's sometime before probably the, uh, well, certainly before the 11th century, um, probably uh, recorded in this form that it survives in, in the late uh, 10th century. Um, but impossible to know for certain. So we are going to be, um, you know, this is a, one of several of our language options that we have at Signum. Uh, this is kind of falls in our Germanic philology wing um, or the concentration that we have in Germanic philology. So we also have Old Norse and Germanic philology as a sequence. Um, and after Beowulf, there'll also be an addition of Old Saxon, which is a very closely related language from the same time period. Uh, ninth century um, uh, text that is in the same style as Beowulf, so the, the um, Haliont, but that's the continental um, German relatives of, of the Anglo-Saxons. Um, so anyway, with Beowulf, I think um, the text has been read 
you know, thousands, millions of times. Um, but I think you can't fully appreciate and understand a text until you have slogged through each and every word and every line and all the interpretations that are necessary, all the philological tidbits and details that you can discover by close reading, slow and close reading of a text. Now, it is a slog, but you still will find that um, I think it takes takes a lot of effort at first um, when studying uh, any language. Um, so this does require, it does require uh, some knowledge of, of Old English, preferably an introduction to Old English course with us or, or an equivalent. Um, uh, so we, uh, we generally kind of have to start out, you know, hitting it hard uh, right in week one. Um, so you can see kind of the schedule here. We pick up speed, obviously, as it goes and explore the different sections. We also have, I believe, um, recordings of Tom Shippey's lectures from a course that he gave um, one per week as a kind of bonus or supplement. So they're not included in the course directly, but it's something that we give out because it's um, highly relevant, I would say. Um, so that is, that's kind of the, the gist of Beowulf. It's a translation seminar for, for um, our language students who have already had some old English. Um, and, you know, we, it, it kind of falls in the category. We also have Etic Poetry, that's a similar course um, uh, for the continuation of Old, of old Norse. Um, and I mentioned we're already going to add one more, um, Old Saxon. We also have an introduction to Gothic, which is yet to add a second semester of that, or second term of Gothic. And someday we will add that. Um, but anyway, it's kind of a, a part and parcel of the larger Germanic philology package. And it is a central text for so many things. Um, obviously, medieval studies, it, it kind of will figure into the top five works of literature. If you have my tastes, there it's in the top three. So, so yeah, oh, fa I think fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we, it was funny. We were talking about long reading lists and reading a book a week. This is not like that. This is one key text, but reading it, you know, taking your time and, you know, hard work going through it because you're reading it in the original language. I mean, this it's so translated and everyone's sort of aware of famous translations. It must be so um, exciting and fun and empowering to actually read what as, not as low or bro or hark or high or hey, mm -hmm. but just as what and actually, and, and all the rest of the words as well and sort of really sort of, you know, take that in. Does it does it excite you as a teacher? You know, you teaching it again and again. Do you still find new things in that? Every every single time a person rereads a text, and this applies to everything, mm -hmm. you will discover new things, no matter what. It's by by the nature of reading a text, whether that's in your native language, or a foreign one, or a historical or dead language, um, uh, you'll always find new things. And I think. We have a slightly linguistic approach when it comes to um, our language classes um, over the literary content itself, but that does factor into it because we can't really understand the text without understanding its its historical or cultural background. Um, there's a lot mm -hmm. of speculation around this text. Uh, the good thing about that is that it, it's open to a lot of interpretive um, interpretative avenues. I think it's kind of you know, wide reaching, um, the volumes of scholarship published on this single text, which was probably not very popular at its day, hence it's only in one manuscript. It, it's it's probably the, um, you know, one of the most written about works of the Middle Ages in the English speaking world and probably the German speaking world too, because they like this stuff too. And Old English is very similar to, to um, German and structure and such, so. Fantastic. But yeah, it's, it's what happens every time you read the text, you'll discover new things. And thanks also for clarifying that this isn't, you know, for complete beginners of Old English, um, but we do offer courses for complete beginners, just not this term. Um, but, uh, you know, keep your eyes out for um, for other language classes that you can just, you can just start off with. Um, and I know, you know, going back to our previous discussion about new students, I know lots of students who who've been really intimidated by uh, the language courses in particular, but they've got so much out of them, and you know they they get they get into it. It clicks after a few weeks. Have you found that as well, uh, Paul? 
you know, you see students sort of get into it. Be because it's not a living language, and I've taught mm -hmm. those two in my career, it's very different to learn to read and translate a, a language in a different form. So it's it's a different skill set. I think that it's kind of like decoding a, a puzzle, but the pieces are all there. And, um, you know, all of the resources and kind of building blocks of understanding and learning a new language are are essential. But I, I, I find that the method that we use in philology is kind of um, it, it's sort of trial by fire, but with a lot of kind of um, uh, sink or swim, but but they give those little safety things that you put on little children, those uh, mm -hmm. blow up inflatable arm uh, uh, floaty things. I think we just call them floaties. Um, we have a lot of those built in when we when we send our students into the waters, um, you know, to, to learn these uh, languages. So we build up very uh, uh, slowly over time as we kind of develop those skills. And there's a very different art to philology versus language uh, study in a more general sense, especially like a spoken language or modern language. The art of philology is just knowing where to look things up. Um, it's where resources are and knowing how to find the answers without, you know, kind of um, producing them, you know, uh, in, in a cold, like a cold call sense. Um, uh, so it, it's something that it's not um, internalizing or memorizing all the information. It's knowing where to look things up in a glossary or a, mm -hmm. or a paradigm or, or a grammatical handout, um, however it is. So we we do a lot of just kind of building up where are the resources available so that you can do the work yourself. And it teaches the, the art of philology, I think, mm -hmm. in practice. And fantastic transactional skill to have that will help you in lots of other things these are just great Anything. research skills yeah. Yeah. yeah um so anthony um says uh, there was once offered two talking themed courses um language invention through talking and philology through talking and anthony wonders are these courses ever going to be offered again i believe so i can't promise when exactly but i do intend us to especially the language invention course i think we'll offer that in the next few years so don't quote me on a specific term but we would like to do it um and i think we would probably have our good friend uh, dr and andy higgins um would most likely be the one leading that course if we re rerun it as far as the beowulf through tolkien course with dr shippy i don't know when we're going to run it next i actually i believe it's on our schedule in the upcoming years but i forget the exact term Great. Well, lots of excited people in the comments saying, yay, very cool. Um, and uh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, let's um, let's move on. Um, we have a couple of uh, general questions coming in. Uh, Lola says, uh, I have missed the start date for the lectures of Le Guin's world building. If you could give me that first lecture date, I'd very much appreciate it. And there's also a kind of similar question from Kimberly. Um, is there a calendar for the academic semester? I know when we begin, but not when we end, nor whether slash when there are breaks for holidays. So um, the term starts end of this month, August 30th, um, and it runs for 12 weeks. So that means I think it's November the, um, the 12th. Um, yes, no, sorry, no, November 21 is end of week 12. However, yeah. sometimes there are some requirements after the end of week 12. So 12 weeks of lectures and and seminars, preceptor sessions um, for both li the literature and the language courses. Occasionally you might have an exam in week 13. So we might go into the last week of November as well. Uh, any anything to add about that from anyone? Oh, about... we we wouldn't do it in we wouldn't go on the Thursday or Friday of that final week right. thirteen because that's Thanksgiving in the United States. So okay, but Good but it know. is true that we often run over into week thirteen with the uh, final exams or papers. But we tend to have those due, you know, at the end of week twelve as a harder deadline, generally. Right. Um, and there's not so, and there's there's not really kind of breaks for holidays because we break we stop before Thanksgiving anyway, which is the big holiday for uh, 
yeah. United States. I forget when Canadian Thanksgiving is. I don't know if it's earlier or later, but um, yeah. Uh, but, but basically, there's no breaks. Um, I, I think for things like uh, Labor Day in the U.S., we just go ahead and have classes because not everybody celebrates um, those days since our students come from around the world. So yeah. Um, uh, I think we just run over most of the holidays. I think the the one exception I did make was July the fourth. Is that the uh -huh. right date? The Independence Day. We just celebrate Dependence Day in the UK, um, but because <laughs> Independence Day was such a big thing, and so many of the students were American, we we made an exception to that because you know. So these things happen. Check with your preceptor, um, but we're not expecting any breaks, um, and. Uh, you can find this information on the website as well, Kimberly, uh, if you go to uh, the new course registration page. Um, it gives you sort of important dates, um, so when dates, uh, when terms begin um, for the next year. It's on the upcoming courses page on the website. Uh, and then Lola has asked very specifically about the first lecture date for the Liguin course. Uh, Chris, to put you on the spot, do you have that date in the calendar yet? Yeah, that's August 30th. That's Monday, August 30th, the first day of the new term. And that is at what time Eastern? That is it. I think that's six o'clock Pacific time, so nine o'clock Eastern. Something like that. Sorry. Okay. That's great. Um, and just to, to make it clear five to you, new sorry, students. Sorry, five o'clock. Five o'clock Pacific. Five o'clock, excellent. Eight o'clock Eastern, my bad. Just to make it clear for new students, if you can't attend the lectures live, that's okay because they will be posted in the course archive. Um, so you can watch the the, the recording. Um, they usually get posted a day or so later. So if you have a preceptor session right after the lecture, that might cause an issue, but just check with your preceptor. Um, I think most of the time it's fine to 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 watch the recording. You don't have to watch the lecture live. You do have to attend the preceptor session live. That is essential. But the lectures can be watched after the recording, even for the live courses it, uh, for literature. For language, you've got to attend live for everything. But they have a different system, as Paul just explained. Um, it's all done in class. Um, so. Um, and and Anthony um, says, with the Hobbit course being mainly pre-recorded lectures, how frowned upon would it be to read and work ahead? Uh, Sarah. I rarely frown upon things. I find that too much effort. No, um, if you want to read ahead, if you want to watch ahead, go for it. Why not? There's absolutely no reason why you should. If you want to devour the whole thing in a couple of weeks, go for it. Um, Yes, I, there's no problem with that. Um, I, I frown upon those who don't watch the lectures in time for the, the preceptor class. That's a whole different ball game. But if you want to watch ahead, no, no reason why you couldn't do that. Excellent. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, you might also want to sort of re-familiarize yourself with the lectures and with the reading for each week if you have gone ahead, because then speaking for myself i sometimes get my head mixed up if i'm in the future or whatever but um you can certainly uh, get a head start uh, if you want to um mm. and um Ori says besides the edic poetry and old norse and the Tolkien to poetry courses will you ever offer a, spe a speculative poetry course or is that beyond the scope of signum uh any I thoughts on that i wouldn't say it's beyond the scope i think it's a matter of prioritization right now so as we're building up our our language offerings we we I, I should tell you guys there is a really neat upcoming course next summer uh digital text with um mm. uh james tauber and that'll be a really really cool avenue that is related to that but not the same i think um you know we have some other priorities too that we'd like to add like Latin um, is one that we definitely have in mind and have had in mind. We have had it before. We're going to bring it back. So with with me making a, a a formal promise, we will bring it back in the next two and a half to three years, no later than that. That's my formal promise. But as far as any other language courses right now, I can't see any coming up. But you never know. So you never know. 
And uh, in the meantime, you can go to signumuniversity.org forward slash classes forward slash future if you want to see what's coming up uh, beyond the autumn term into spring and summer 2022, uh, the far, far future. So, um, but until that point, we have these four fantastic courses. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, Faith, Paul, and Sarah for uh, sharing your uh, your thoughts and your wisdom and your knowledge about these upcoming courses. Um, uh, it's a, always a difficult choice for students choosing just uh, what they want to study and what they're going to study this term, but uh, uh, I think there's some really exciting choices there. Um, best of luck to all of you. If you're signed up for a course, if you're studying with us this semester, uh, whether that is as an auditor, a discussion auditor, or a full-blown credit student, best of luck in the upcoming term. Uh, it's going to be hard work, but it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be so rewarding and enriching. And just remember the advice about uh, reaching out for help if you need it and using your fellow students as a resource, because we are one community. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great semester, and we'll see you around at future events. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.